start with a little quote from the man in the title of this talk, which is John Maynard Keynes. This is his magnum opus, his general theory. I've read it so that you don't have to. Um, but he says in it, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy with some academic scribbler of a few years back. Now, he wrote these words in his general theory in the 1930s to describe the Stalinists on one side uh, and obviously the kind of Hayekian free market types on the other uh, who preached the wonders of the free market um, and, and the invisible hand a la Adam Smith. But today I would say these very words of Keynes describe best the Keynesians themselves in the sense that they are on the, on the left uh, these voices that are constantly harking back to the ideas of some defunct economist, i.e. Keynes himself. It's very fashionable uh, in left circles to try and come up with new ideas. We're constantly told Marxism is incorrect because it's old. We need new ideas. So we get all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas put forward by these kind of economic advisors around the movement, around the Corbyn movement in particular. We see sound bites and slogans, uh, people talking about the Preston model, municipal socialism. We get uh, demands from think tanks and academics for 21st century public ownership and uh, the idea of inclusive ownership funds. And of course, as we'll discuss later today, there's the demand, the zeitgeist demand for a Green New Deal, which we're told by the proponents of modern monetary theory, we can afford quite easily by creating more money and spending, spending, spending. Now, in reality, I'd say there's nothing new about any of these ideas. Uh, all of them really are actually very old ideas. Modern monetary theory, even itself, is very much a misnomer in that it's not very modern and it's not really a theory. Um, and uh, as I said, all of these ideas, all of these demands in reality are resurrecting the ideas of some defunct economist, which is uh, John Maynard Keynes, as I'll discuss in the talk today. Now, the main thr thrust, the main premise, really, of all of these kind of ideas is that austerity is ideological, that it's not something flowing from the system, that it's something that just comes about because of a lack of political will. And in reality, what this really boils down to is the idea that we can reform capitalism, that somehow we can make capitalism nice and responsible, and these days, obviously, green as well, a nice green capitalism. In other words, we can try and patch up the system rather than overthrowing it. And again, far from offering any new ideas, I'd say this is actually the oldest idea itself. The idea that you can reform capitalism is as old as capitalism itself. And the real failure, the key proof really of the failure of this idea of reform is reforming capitalism comes when we look at what happens when these kind of reformist ideas get put into practice in power. As Lenin said, politics is concentrated economics and it's the failure of reformist political leaders that really highlights the failure of their reformist economic program. We see that nowhere else better than in Greece right now, where just this year, the reformist government, the left reformist, supposed to be a radical left government of Syriza, when it came to power, promising to end austerity. In the last few months, it's been unceremoniously booted out of power. Why? Because they didn't end austerity. In fact, they carried on austerity and in fact made worse austerity enacted worse austerity than the kind of Greek Tories that came before them. But this general idea is very prevalent, I'd say, in the British Labour movement as well. Fundamentally, we hear it every day. What's the, what do we need? We just need to get rid of the nasty Tories. That's all we need. If we get rid of the nasty Tories, everything will go back to the nice good old days of the past. Yes, I think the Tories are nasty. I think they're very nasty people. I'm sure they are very overjoyed as representatives of the capitalist class, although normally they're representatives of the capitalist class. Boris Johnson famously said, pardon my French, fuck business uh, recently in relation to Brexit. But in general, yeah, these people, they do, you know, desire to attack the working class. They do take a certain uh, pride in, in private ownership and the free market. But the point is the ruling class doesn't like austerity. They would like, if they could, to carry on with their system without having to attack the working class because that generates social and political instability that they could certainly do without. The point is they have no other way out of this crisis other than to cut. 
And that is something we have to make very clear. It's a, it's a message we have to take into the Corbyn movement, into the Labour movement, that come, when come to power, a Corbyn movement is also, if it doesn't break with capitalism, going to have to carry out these cuts also. So what we see on the left in general is instead of austerity, what we're told we need growth. You know, no nasty austerity, we need nice growth instead. Again, a bit of a strange idea, as though the capitalists don't also like growth. It's not like the capitalists like stagnation, like depression, again, with all the competition and the cuts that comes with it. The point is growth isn't something you can just turn on and off like a tap. The question we have to ask, really, and what the Keynesians never really explain, is why have we got no growth today? Why has private investment, business investment now dried up? And this is obviously where the ideas of Marx come in. Marx explained that real growth comes from a development of the productive forces, from the capitalists reinvesting their surplus into new means of production, into new productive forces. And under capitalism, that is driven by profits. Capitalism is a system where all of this only takes place in order for the capitalists to make a profit. In normal times, the capitalists will get their profits reinvest because of competition. They're trying to seek out new technologies, new machinery, that will lower their cost of production below that of their competitors and in doing so uh, allow them to make a super profit. But the point is that in this process you have the seeds of, of, of its own destruction where that competition drives down conditions and the productive forces expand and expand until they come up against the limits of the market. And that is what Marx called uh, uh, overproduction. He said you get these crises of overproduction where the productive forces go beyond the limits of the market. Now, Keynesians, by contrast, don't talk about overproduction in terms of uh, the crisis of capitalism, but what they call underconsumption, what Marx uh, referred to as underconsumption. Again, an idea that predates Keynes. There was under other economic theorists uh, before Keynes who had a similar idea of where crisis came from, people like Malthus and, uh, and others. Now, in this essence, what this boils down to is the idea that crisis is not due to the productive forces uh, expanding beyond their limits, but rather that you just have a lack of what Keynes called effective demand. In other words, there's no demand on the one hand for uh, capital goods in terms of investment from capitalists, but on the other side, consumer goods in terms of the purchasing power of households. Now, Keynes correctly identified something that Marx had already identified, which is this vicious circle that you get into in capitalism of a, of a slump that generates an even deeper slump. In other words, where you have a lack of demand due to unemployment, you'll then have a lack of investment due to the lack of demand, and then you'll have a lack of jobs because of the lack of investment. And this is a, a downward spiral that, that is uh, impossible really for capitalism to, to get out of. And such a vicious circle was what we saw in the times of the Great Depression that Keynes obviously lived through. It's what prompted him to, to write his general theory. He was obviously profoundly affected by this historical period, the deepest crisis of capitalism that he saw around him. And the question Keynes sought to answer was, how do you get out of that crisis? How could the capitalists get out of that crisis? And that's something very key. It's how could the capitalists get out of this crisis? Because Keynes was not a left, you know? And this is something we have to really emphasize when people quote Keynes in the labor movement today and look towards Keynesian ideas, Keynes was not a left. He was a liberal. He was, in fact, a member of the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party even wanted him to stand as prime minister, but he had the, the, the foresight to see that people don't like politicians uh, and it's better to just be an economist in the background. But he said quite openly that he was not in favor of communism. He denounced communism. He distanced himself from the labor movement. And he even said, and I quote, the class war will find me on the side of the educated bourgeoisie. And that was how he saw himself, this Cambridge academic uh, who was on the side of the educated bourgeoisie. He saw his role of basically trying to save capitalism, save the system from itself. Now, Marx had said that really economic theory reached a high point from the classical days with people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo. After that, the people who came after had to actually go backwards in terms of economics. They stopped treating economics like a science because the only way forwards with economics after 
Adam Smith and Ricardo was the ideas of Marxism, which obviously showed the inherent contradictions within capitalism. And so all the subsequent economists had to go backwards and deny the kind of material uh, aspects, the, the, the scientific aspects of economics, and instead resort to all sorts of idealism. And for that reason, Marx called them the vulgar economists. Uh, and Keynes also criticized some of these people who were obviously, for him, his bourgeois predecessors. He thought they had too much of a fixation with the idea of the invisible hand and the, the so-called efficiency of the market. He really, he criticized these people effectively because all they were were apologists for capitalism. They weren't trying to explain economics anymore as a science, but really just trying to apologize for all the in inequalities and the inefficiencies of capitalism. But the problem with the Great Depression is it posed a new task. It said now, it wasn't enough to apologize for capitalism. It was clearly failing. The system was clearly failing. What was needed instead was to save the system, save capitalism. And that was the task that Keynes tried to outline with his theories. And he believed fundamentally this task fell to the state, to the capitalist state. And we've got to be very clear. The state has a class character and, and, and it is clearly a capitalist state as at, at the moment in, under capitalism. And Keynes believed this capitalist state should step in and effectively try and overcome the individual interests of the capitalists and try and save the system and save the, the capitalist class as a whole rather than the, the individual capitalists who are all just pursuing their own short-term profit making. The state had to step in and try and save the system as its whole. And therefore he said the role of government, the role of the state should be to stimulate growth through increasing this uh, if effective demand through public investment. In other words, what you would try and do is create a virtuous circle by the state stepping in, putting money into workers' pockets that they could spend on consumer goods, and this would then increase the demand for, for, for capital goods and investment, and you'd try and get some sort of uh, positive uh, v virtuous cycle instead of a vicious one. Now, Keynes believed that the best way to do this would be to spend on things that were actually socially useful, to build houses and so forth. But he was a cynic at the end of the day, and he said, if, if this isn't possible, then you might as well pay people to dig holes in the ground, fill them up with little bottles of, uh, of money, and then to dig those holes back up again, take the money and go home and spend it. In other words, just useless uh, labor, but one that would fundamentally put money into workers' pockets. So he was very cynical about uh, really what should be done here. He didn't care so much about filling social needs as just getting the economy going. That was the main thing. Now. Engels actually argued against this idea long before Keynes uh, was around um, with another underconsumptionist, a man called uh, During, who he wrote polemics against uh, in his, what has become known as anti-During, which I'm sure you can find in the bookshop. But he noted basically that you can't just create demand. Uh, you know, you can, the, what you're effectively talking about here is distributing wealth from one part of the economy to another, but you're not creating any new value. You can't create demand out of thin air. And this point was actually emphasized also by Ted Grant, who was a uh, founder of Socialist Appeal. And uh, he wrote back in the 60s during the, the post-war boom an article called Will There Be a Slump, which predicted the slump of the 70s that ended the post-war boom. And in that, he points out the, the deficiencies of this Keynesian idea. He said that governments can't uh, really just spend. They have no money of their own fundamentally. The state can employ people. It can invest. But this doesn't create value. Instead, what the state does is it redistributes value from one part of the economy uh, to another. It, it redistributes value created in the real economy. Real value is generated in the productive process by the application of labor, by the labor power, by the, the application of labor by the working class in the productive process. Uh, and, uh, and this value then has to be realized on the market in the terms of exchange, the exchange of commodities. The value is, is embodied within commodities. That labor is embodied within those commodities, that value that is then exchanged, and that's where the value is realized. Now, again, under capitalism, the key point is that all of that productive process occurs because of the drive for profit, and the capitalists invest in order to make a profit. So what you can see is that the, the government, the state, it can spend money, but only by taking demand from elsewhere, by taxing the rich, for example, taxing the capitalists, which dis disincentivizes investment and reduces investment, that level, that side of demand, or 
you can tax the working class, which just reduces their purchasing power and bites into consumption. But overall, the overall level of demand in the economy stays the same. It's just moved around and put under government hands. Now, this is where we come on to the ideas of mon monetary theory, because uh, mod modern monetary theory, because what the state can do, obviously, is to print money or create money in reality. It doesn't so much print money anymore. Most of you probably paid online to be here uh, without any cash exchanging hands. But um, the point is, obviously, a government can create money. It can also borrow money. Uh, the central bank, in particular, is responsible for the money supply these days. This is where modern monetary theory comes in. And in effect, I would say it's a kind of neo-Keynesianism. It's a kind of turbocharged Keynesianism uh, that is very popular now amongst some on the left. It's been uh, you know, made uh, quite uh, prominent by uh, left-wing politicians in the US in particular, people like Alexandro Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, it's also been advocated by the economic advisors to people like Bernie Sanders and also here in Britain, Chris Williamson, a uh, left-wing MP who's been hounded out of the Labour Party, is quite a fan of uh, modern monetary theory. He was even speaking at a fringe meeting at the Labour conference this year uh, alongside one of the key proponents of modern monetary theory, a man called Bill Mitchell, uh, uh, on this very topic. And what you see is that modern monetary theory is very much tied in. It's, it's pretty much in the same breath these days as the demand for a Green New Deal. In other words, how are we going to afford a Green New Deal? Modern monetary theory. The two very much go hand in hand. Now, what exactly does modern monetary theory propose? Well, like I said, you can watch whole lectures of hours long and still not really have a clue as to what's being uh, talked about with modern monetary theory. It's, uh, it's almost purposely designed to bamboozle you. But again, I've read a lot of uh, blogs and uh, listened to a lot of podcasts, so I'll try and sum it up uh, for you. Uh, instead, and I'll try and be as fair to it as possible because I don't want to attack straw men, but this is fundamentally what is being proposed. What MMT advocates say is it's not even really so much a theory, they say themselves, so much as a lens, what they say. It's a lens, a perspective for how we can look at the economy in a radical new way, uh, a radical perspective to see how the economy really works. Now, I would say that is a theory, actually. I think that's precisely the point of theory, is to try and look at stuff and analyse how it really works. Uh, but that point aside, what does MMT say? Well, it has a few key assertions. The first of all is they say that governments that are in control of their own uh, currencies, what they call sovereign countries, that uh, have an independent uh, kind of monetary policy, in other words, you're not pegged to the dollar, you're not in a single currency like the euro, uh, or, or, or you don't have lots of debts to an imperialist power. That already rules out quite a lot of countries, we should say. We're talking basically about the US, Britain, Australia, Canada, which no coincidence happens to be wo most where, where most MMT advocates come from. Anyway, let's put aside that, that point. Uh, again, I don't want to tax raw men. They say those governments, where they're in control of the monetary supply, they can uh, never run out of money because you can always create more money to pay for debts. You can always uh, afford to, to pay for stuff as long as you have control of, of the, the money tap. Um, now, the second point they say is you don't have to worry about inflation as well, which is another kind of break with orthodoxy. And they in particular say you don't have to worry about inflation as long as what they, there's what they call excess capacity in the system. In other words, there's spare resources. You've got unemployed workers, you've got unused factories, you've got in other words, the conditions we find today, which is true, there's a lot of excess capacity in the system. There's a lot of productive forces, as we would call them, unused because capitalism uh, cannot utilize them. And as long as that's the case, then you can keep, the government will keep spending and it can use these resources and you won't get inflation. They say that's fine. And so in that words, in other words, budget deficits are also not a problem, which is uh, something you see MMT advocates advocate. They say, you know, it's quite fine for, for a government to run a budget deficit. And in fact, this is the third point, governments don't need to tax in order to spend, but what you see apparently is that governments spend, they, 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 they pay for military and, uh, and, and NHS and all these things, and then they collect the taxes later, basically to manage the economy. It's, uh, taxes are a way, kind of like uh, the nuclear rods, uh, have anyone seen Chernobyl? Uh, it's kind of like that. That's where it all goes wrong. That's where you get your inflation when your control rods aren't working. But uh, taxes are like your control rods. They suck the energy out of the system, stop it overheating. And that, and that effectively is what inflation is. It's overheating. 
of the economy, according to them, and the taxes are like your control rods. Now, that is basically the main assertions of MMT. Now, they say there's no policy proposals that flow from this. It's just this lens. You know, we're not advocating policy. Just so happens, however, that there are, across the board, universal kind of uh, conclusions drawn from MMT, which is basically this, that governments shouldn't respond to crisis with austerity, but with public spending. And that you don't need to borrow in order to do this, but you can print money, or in reality, create money by adding some zeros with a keyboard. That's how most money is made these days. It's not printed at the printing press. It's put into people's pockets through their bank accounts, uh, through loans and, and, and credit cards and so forth. Now, in this respect, we can clearly see that MMT is a response to the crisis of capitalism. The fact that for the last 10 years, governments across the board have responded to the crisis with austerity. And that has failed. We are still in a crisis today. We are no better off today. In fact, real wages have stagnated completely for the last 10 years. There's been no uh, you know, uh, rise in investment. The economy is, 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 is stalled, basically, and has been for the last 10 years with no perspective in sight. That is all true. But the problem is two wrongs don't make a right. It's not enough to say that austerity doesn't work. Therefore, we turn on the money taps. We need a correct understanding of what's actually going on with the crisis, what's going on with capitalism, and, uh, and, and we need correct ideas. And I would say the key problem with MMT is it flows from its uh, misunderstanding, uh, or it's what it claims is its understanding of money, but is in fact a misunderstanding of money. MMT says that money is imposed by states, fundamentally. The, the, the origins of money is, is the state coming along and saying, you need to pay us taxes, and uh, in order to do that, you need to obviously pay us in a certain currency. And you'd create the demand for a currency by imposing taxes on a population. It's kind of almost like an anarchist theory that puts all this emphasis on the question of the state as being fundamentally the evil in society. Now, this originates with a, a, an idea called the state theory of money, or chartalism as it's also known, which was invented by a, a 19th century German economist called George Knapp. Now, I would say, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, Knapp, Knapp. Uh, anyway, George Knapp, 19th century German economist. I would say we need the ideas of another German 19th century <laughs> economist uh, to explain what really goes on with money. And you know who I'm talking about. It's Karl Marx. Um, now, Marx explained that money and the state actually both have common origins in the development of class society. And the development of money rises with the development of commodity production and exchange, the division of society into classes, the division of labor, and the production of things not for individual consumption or for societal consumption, but for exchange, for a market. That's what a commodity is, something produced for exchange on a market. And this goes all the way back to class society. It's not new under capitalism, and uh, that's something we should also point out. This goes all the way back. Money is rises up out of this system as like a yardstick, uh, a representation of value. It's like a universal equivalent, Marx said, basically, that allows the act of exchange to be broken up into a purchase on one side and a sale on another. In other words, it facilitates trade, it facilitates exchange. Money plays other roles as well. It's a store of value, it's a unit of account, and, uh, and, 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 and if you really want to know a lot more, you can watch my talk from last year's Revolution Festival on what is money. Uh, but uh, fundamentally, this is the point of money, uh, is uh, a representation of value. And this value, as we'll also discuss later in the economic session this afternoon, value is socially necessary labor time, Marx said. It's the labor time needed for the production of commodities on average. It's embedded within uh, a commodity. And the value then, as I say, is realized through the act of exchange. We work out what the socially necessary labor time is by exchanging with other uh, people. And we find it presented as an objective value on the market in the form of a market price. It's the average uh, time needed to produce a given commodity in the certain social, historical, technological conditions. Money, in other words, has no intrinsic value. It doesn't, you know, money is not worth something, you know, the paper today we have with you know money is obviously you know the paper itself is worth nothing the money yet has a value uh, because of uh, its representation of value uh, and you see that even more clearly obviously with the idea of digital money today there's obviously nothing valuable about some numbers on a screen um, but it is a symbol of value however just because money has a symbolic value it doesn't mean it's arbitrary or subjective it's still 
has a basis in objective conditions. In other words, you can't print money without limits. There's no free lunch under capitalism. That is a very important point we have to emphasize. The money that's in circulation has to be tied to something real. It has to be tied to the value of the commodities that are also in circulation that that money is fundamentally representing. So in other words, if you print more money, you create more money, you increase the money supply, that has to match an increase in the commodities that are in circulation also. If not, then you do get inflation, a general increase in prices, because you have more money chasing the same amount of goods. You know, uh, In other words, if you print more money, you create more money, but you've got the same amount of commodities, then all of that money just basically is going to increase in, uh, in, in, in terms of price, because it's still representing the same number of commodities. Now, under capitalism, there's a kind of feedback mechanism where generally the money supply remains stable because actually it's not governments that really decide the money supply, but rather it's the private sector. You have private banks creating loans and credit cards, increasing the money supply. Uh, you know, 97% of the money supply is actually dictated by money created by private banks in response to demand. People come looking for mortgages. Businesses come looking for loans to invest. And that demand on one side creates a demand for money and you get an increase in the money supply. And so therefore, there's a kind of balancing out. Um, and that's the kind of stabilizing mechanism under capitalism. So what you see really is that governments, they can, they can create money, but they can't determine what that money is worth. And really, uh, what you see in a government or other central bank really at the moment, uh, which is supposed to be independent, although I don't really believe that under capitalism, uh, they're very much tools of the capitalist class, obviously. But they can print money, but they can't print teachers and doctors. They can't print schools and hospitals. And MMT kind of recognizes this. It says that the real limit to, the, to, the, to what a state can spend is the resources in society, similar to what we'd say in the sense of the real limit to any uh, economy is the development of the productive forces. You can't uh, you know, just spend money to try and employ more doctors if there's a limited number of doctors out there. There is obviously a limit on the supply side, as they say. But this then really begs a question, which is what I think MMT and Keynes uh, also never really identified, never really explained, is if you've got all of these resources out there that aren't being utilized currently, well, why? You know, why is it that under capitalism, these essentials of life, like doctors and, and hospitals, like schools and teachers, are not being utilized? Why are they not being provided? Why is there such a lack of these things? Why, in other words, does the state have to step in in the first place? In fact, what we find under capitalism is not that there's a lack of resources and uh, therefore inflation is a problem. At the moment, they're worried about deflation. They're worried about, in other words, too much. There's not enough demand in the economy. Uh, there's, a, there's a general uh, lack of, uh, of demand, a, a, a massive amount of supply. There's all these resources lying idle. In other words, what you have under capitalism is what Marx explained. Poverty amidst plenty. Uh, you have a housing crisis amidst empty houses around here in particular, these things being used as assets rather than homes. You have millions of people unemployed and yet clearly there is a need for people to be building things, for us to create a lot more. So how do you explain all of these contradictions? And I think here we see how MMT and Keynesianism really arrive at the same place. These theories offer solutions, so-called solutions to get out of a crisis in, you know, through government spending, through printing money, so to speak. But they never really explain why uh, there's a crisis in the first place. Why is there a lack of, uh, of, of effective demand? Why is there an abundance of excess capacity to begin with? Neither Keynesianism nor MMT, in other words, really offer a theory of crisis. They really only offer a suggestion of how the capitalists can try to get out of a crisis once it has already occurred. And in this sense, as I said, Keynesianism at root is not a theory of crisis. It's not an economic theory at all, really. It's a program for the capitalists. It's a bourgeois intellectual telling the capitalists how they can temporarily save themselves and their system. And this is where, obviously, the Keynesians and their MMT acolytes today suggest you know, things like public investment and spending. But they don't say, why is there a lack of business investment and hence no growth in the first place? Why is investment now at an all-time low? And there's really no need, in fact, to be printing money at all. What we see is there's clearly no lack of money. In fact, 
There's been plenty of studies showing that big business today sits on piles of cash. In uh, the UK, I think it's something like 700 billion of money that could basically be spent tomorrow if there was a profitable use for it. In the US, something like $2 trillion, I think. In the Eurozone, it's about the same, 2 trillion euros. Apple alone, I believe, sits on something like $250 billion that it doesn't spend. You know, it could spend if it wanted to, but it has no use for this money. And the failure of quantitative easing shows a similar thing, which is that you can't solve the crisis with just increasing the money supply alone. They've been massively increasing the money supply with quantitative easing, which I won't go in again to describe exactly what that is, but take my word for it, it's basically increasing the money supply. But one commentator summed it up very well when they said, it's like pushing on a piece of string. You can't do it. You know, If there's nothing tugging on the other side, then it's just a load of slack. And as I said, the main problem the bourgeois talk about now is not actually inflation, but deflation, because there's, there's, there's no demand in the economy. There's this general stagnation. And uh, this was summed up quite well in The Guardian, where the economics editor, Larry uh, Elliott, I believe his name is, he said, he described MMT as like being akin to pumping up a flat tire. But we've got to ask the question, why was there a puncture in the first place? And that's something none of them have ever explained. Why is there this downward spiral of depression and slump? And the reason for this obviously lies in understanding capitalism's crisis, which are not crises of underconsumption, but of overproduction, of a saturated market, of, yes, enormous excess capacity in all, in all countries exists on a world scale. And again, going back to what Engels said, he pointed out in anti-during that this, uh, this idea of underconsumption is fundamentally flawed. There is, in fact, a restricted consumption of the masses in, throughout history, throughout class society, and particularly under capitalism, it's a permanent feature, the poverty of the masses, this uh, underconsumption, as they say. What we have instead under capitalism is overproduction, not uh, people uh, starving and famine because there's too little, but because there's too much. And this is an intrinsic you know, flaw, an intrinsic contradiction within capitalism due to the way in which profits uh, uh, come about. The origins of profits of surplus value lie in the fact that the working class does not receive back the full value of its labor. Workers are paid for their labor power in the form of wages, but they produce far more in the course of the day than what they're paid back. They only receive a fraction. And therefore, the working class under capitalism can never afford to buy back all that it, it, it produces. The capitalists will always have this uh, excess capacity because capitalism produces for a profit. And, uh, and, and, and ultimately, because they produce for a profit, they, if they can't sell their commodities because of this, uh, this, this, this overproduction, then that means they will stop producing and the economy grinds to a halt. People starve and are made unemployed, Marx says in the Communist Manifesto, not because there's too little, but because there's too much too much industry, too much commerce, too much means of subsistence, he says. And no amount of clever tricks can circumvent these contradictions of capitalism. You can't have capitalism without its contradictions. This is the key point we have to say to those who want to try and reform capitalism, uh, particularly along Keynesian or MMT lines. Now, the real question we should also answer is why is there not a permanent crisis under capitalism? It might seem like there is today. We haven't had anything but crisis the last 10 years. But obviously, a lot of the so-called normal times, you don't have a crisis. How do the capitalists get out of that? Well, Marx obviously highlights that, says the capitalists can always temporarily overcome the overproduction through investment, through wars, through uh, the expansion of credit. In other words, creating new means of production by investing their, 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 their surplus back into new productive forces, searching for new markets in the form of colonies and imperialism, obviously, and the artificial expansion of the market through credits, through loans, credit cards, and, and mortgages, and so forth. But the thing is, all of these methods have been tried, and they've pushed capitalism to its limits, and in fact, gone beyond its limits over the last 100 years. In fact, I think just two days ago, was the 90th anniversary of the Wall Street crash, which marked the beginning of the Great Depression. At the time, the biggest crisis of capitalism. And now, obviously, we're over a decade uh, beyond the financial crisis that, that hit in 2008, that, that is what is responsible for the continued crisis today. That has not ended. And you can see how the, the ways in which the capitalists 
got out of these crises, including with Keynesian methods in the past, only ever paved the way, paved the way for much bigger crises like the one we're seeing today. And we can see that clearly with actually the historic failure of where Keynesianism has been tried in practice. In particular, the New Deal, which was, what it was a, an implementation of the very ideas Keynes outlined in his general theory. The idea of mass government spending, you know, the Hoover uh, administration and uh, FDR, sorry, um, Hoover Dam I was thinking of, FDR and uh, building of, uh, of these kind of, uh, these giant infrastructure projects. Um, these sort of things were done to try and stimulate economy and, and, and mop up unemployment. And obviously are the, are the inspiration behind things like the Green New Deal today. It's, the clue is in the name, obviously, this model uh, that was used in the past. But in reality, the, the New Deal uh, under FDR in America it fundamentally failed. Actually, unemployment went up after the, the, Green New, um, the New Deal sorry, was, uh, was implemented. And in fact, the only thing that really stopped the Great Depression was the enormous destruction of the Second World War, which mopped up all the unemployed into armies and utilized the productive forces to try and uh, basically destroy other productive forces elsewhere, um, which just shows you what a, what a barbaric uh, contradiction capitalism uh, generates. You know, we destroy <laughs> the, the means of, of living in order to live, uh, which seems quite bizarre. Uh, and, but... Keynes himself, on, the, on looking back on the, the New Deal and the failure of it and the Second World War, was even forced to admit, he said, it seems, uh, it is, it seems politically impossible for a capitalistic democracy to organize expenditure on the scale necessary to make the grand experiments which would prove my case, except in war conditions. In other words, he's saying the only way in which Keynesianism is relevant is when we destroy each other uh, in, in these giant imperialist uh, you know, carnages. And I think that equally implies today, applies today when we look at the question of fighting a war against climate change. The, you know, even today we see how it, no amount of managing or trying to regulate capitalism is going to solve the climate crisis, which is fundamentally, as we'll discuss in the other session this afternoon, fundamentally due to capitalism and its insatiable drive for profits. Now, an even bigger demonstration of the failure of Keynesianism is seen in China today actually where you've had the largest Keynesian program in history uh, where in, in the wake of the slump of 2008 the Chinese government uh, tried to maintain growth which had been reliant on exports by trying to just invest and invest in uh, public uh, projects and this resulted in enormous crises across the board you've had a huge build-up of government debt in China enormous credit bubbles investment into you know roads that go nowhere into houses that lie empty and most importantly what you've seen is where they've stimulated industry through protectionism and so forth it's led to an enormous uh, excess uh, capacity enormous increase in overproduction on a world scale and you've seen how now you know in britain steel plants closing down because there's this glut of steel from china that is what you that is a, a symptom of this keynesian effort to get out of the crisis in China, which has had exacerbating effects across the whole world in increasing crisis and exporting crisis fundamentally elsewhere. And um, what, what we see in Britain, obviously, is people looking kind of nostalgically back to the times of the post-war boom, you know, the so-called spirit of 45. Back then, we, we had Keynesian investment, we had, uh, you know, building of council houses, the NHS, and we did it all at a time when D GDP to debt ratios uh, de debt to GDP ratios were 200 or 250 percent but that was fundamentally a different epoch the background then was one of unprecedented economic growth stability expansion of world trade and fundamentally that was underpinned by the the the, the, the kind of dominance of US imperialism this hegemonic power that broke down trade barriers for its own benefit and Ted Grant explained that again in his article will there be a slump he said the post-war boom was due to a number of factors, things like the destruction of World War II, the fact that you had martial aid flooding in and rebuilding economies. You had new technologies because of state expenditure, not because of the capitalists. And you had an expansion of world trade, as I said, underpinned by US imperialism. But none of that really is the perspective today, even not only for us, but for the serious bourgeois themselves. None of these factors exist. 
What have we got instead? We've got a shrinking world market, or at least a slowing down in world trade. You've got a rise of protectionism between uh, US and China, the two big imperialist powers. You've got a deep world slump and talk of another deep world slump in the next year. You've got what they call secular stagnation rather than unprecedented economic growth. And really, I would say it's a damning indictment of the so-called lefts in the labor movement today, these economic advisors, it's a damning indictment of them that they call upon the ideas of Keynes to try and get us out of this. Because, as I said, Keynes wasn't on the side of the working class. And they really, these people, I would say, have no faith in the working class themselves. Keynes did, as I say, criticize his bourgeois predecessors for their zealous belief in the free market and the idea of long-term equilibrium. He said, in the long run, we're all dead, which uh, is very true. We need to solve problems right now. And he criticized the Hayekian types, but his criticisms were very one-sided. He went to the opposite extreme, aggregated the economy into one big lump, and uh, treated it like some sort of macroeconomic equation, when in fact the economy is not an equation on a whiteboard. It is living people trying to go about their lives. It is fundamentally class struggle over the surplus in society, as Marx pointed out. Now, Keynes's criticisms that he did make Obviously, uh, that now are what the labor movement lefts kind of call upon. Yeah, he criticized the free market and uh, the invisible hand, <coughs> called for the state to step in. But as I said, his criticisms and his advice came because he wanted to save capitalism practically. He was a pragmatist in his own uh, view. And that obviously appeals to the so-called pragmatists around us today that we find at the tops of the labor movement. These people who tell us that we're utopians for believing in socialism. But I would say after a decade of crisis and with no end in sight to the crisis, things have turned into their opposite. Actually, it's the pragmatists now who want to reform capitalism who are the real utopians. And it's us, the revolutionaries, who talk about overthrowing capitalism, who are the only realists. We're the only ones offering an actual real way out of this crisis. The Keynesians obviously want the governments uh, to, to, to stimulate the economy. And the MMTers obviously effectively say, the same thing. They want, uh, they want effectively the state to step in and manage capitalism in their own words by taking over the means of, not of the means of production, but the means of production of money. That's a quote from uh, the, the erstwhile Bill Mitchell who I talked about earlier. Now, I would say despite the idea that this is transformative politics uh, offered up by, you know, again, this is a phrase the MMT has used to describe the three, this offers up transformative politics. I'd say there's nothing radical in any of these ideas, really. Private property and the profit system are left completely unchallenged. The market remains untouched. Real power lies in the hands of the capitalist class. And it, according to these theories, it will remain in the hands of the capitalist class because they will remain in control of the means of production. And that's the key to the power. It's the economic ownership of the production that is in the hands of the capitalist class, the invisible hands, so to speak, that is ultimately the source of their power. And all of these theories, rather than trying to uh, uh, you know, overthrow the system, attempt fundamentally to try and patch it up. I would say rather than printing money or creating money, we need to rationally plan production. And the, the, the point is you can't plan what you don't control and you don't control what you don't own. So our demand is not for the state to step in and to print money, the capitalist state in particular, obviously, should not be stepping in to, to print money, to, to, to just spend uh, left, right, and center. Our demand should be for the nationalization of the banks, of the big monopolies that dominate the economy and, uh, and thus dominate our lives. And these need to be placed under democratic workers' control and management so that we can take production out of the market, stop commodity production exchange, and plan the economy under a socialist plan of production in a democratic and rational way. Not printing money, but doing away with the money system itself by putting things under a rational plan of production and, and having an economy based on needs, not profits. That's the way that we can begin to use all these resources that are lying idle at the moment. Use these to, to address the problems we face as a society. This is really the only way to genuinely liberate humanity, not with any clever tricks and not to, with these ideas that at best are basically a palliative medicine and at worst are, are a quack remedy, I would say. This is, this is snake oil that's being sold to us here and we have to say that uh, very openly.
The only thing that's going to liberate us is providing a genuine scientific analysis of the problems confronting us and understanding the economic laws of play so that we can what? Not try and you know, reform those laws, but fundamentally change them and replace them with a new set of laws based on democratic socialist planning and workers' control. That is the task that Marx set himself with his economic writings, in particular things like Capital, his great work. And that is the task that lies, us, uh, lies before us now to understand the world in order to change it. And I'll end by paraphrasing a famous quote by Marx. I'd say the economists up till now have only interpreted capitalism in various ways. The point is to overthrow it.